podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Chris Stemp here. Hope you're all doing well out there in the world. This week on the podcast, we are talking about your brain sex or the sex of your brain. That's a weird way to put it, but I think it's kind of catchy, right? What does that even mean? Well, the truth is modern research confirms what all of us know. There are gender-based differences in the brain. Now, it's not as simple as a binary between a male brain and a female brain. But in fact, our brains are kind of like, well, as our guest this week puts it, a mosaic, where there's this spectrum of male and female and what that even means. So aside from just being cool and all the neuroscience stuff we geek out on in this episode, we really talk about how if you're a leader in this world, maybe in your organization, how can it help to know the sex of the brain of those on your team. Again, it'll all make sense when you listen to the interview. And our guest this week is the expert on brain sex, Kate Lands. So Kate is the founder and CEO of MindBridge, an executive coaching and business performance consultancy. In this consultancy, they specialize in applied neuroscience. Kate has an undergraduate degree in psychology, She received her MBA and now has ongoing doctoral research into brain gender difference in business. Her newest book is All the Brains in the Business, The Engendered Brain in the 21st Century Organization. We're going to turn it over to Kate here. Don't forget, if you like what you hear, check us out, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. Actually, this week, you'll notice at the end of this episode, I would definitely stick around, Three of our Patreon supporters submitted questions, and I just turned them over to Kate. So you can imagine if this is a subject you're interested in, or you're a leader, or you're into brain science, if you're a Patreon supporter, you could have submitted any question to Kate, and I would directly ask her. So essentially, it's a straight line to our guests. All you have to do is head on over to patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast and support us as little as two bucks a month. Thank you to all of you supporting us there. Thank you to all of you listening. And thank you especially also to those that uh, share this podcast, you know, with a friend. That's maybe the best thing you could do. Here it is. We're going to be talking to Kate Lands about your brain sex and her newest book, All the Brains in the Business, The Engendered Brain in the 21st Century Organization. Enjoy. I feel like anytime we're talking about gender, gender differences, strengths among sexes, I'm going to piss somebody off. Like I'm going to (laughs) say something wrong and they're going to go, oh, you're a sexist or you're prejudiced or you're just such a guy. Is that something that comes with the territory when you're dealing with talking about the differences in in sexes and different strengths? What I find is most people are just fascinated to find out about the sex of their brain and curious to know what you know where they end up on the brain sex spectrum and and the the point that I'm trying to really get across with Paul so I co-wrote the book with with a, a dear friend um, Professor Paul Brown because we wanted to model what you know practice what we were preaching and and show up in partnership as a male brain and a female brain writing the book but it's all about really understanding individual brains and and knowing the differences between different sex brains so that instead of working in ignorance of them you can work with them and leverage the differences so i'm i have definitely worked in some quite hostile environments but what i find is that people get so intrigued by the neuroscience that all of that hostility falls away and they just become fascinated by some of the the sex differences in the brain and then finding out what their own brain sex is. Now, I got to admit, when I hear this phrase, you know, the sex of your brain, I'm going, okay, that can't be a thing. (laughs) Tell us, for those that are unaware, haven't read the book, what does that even mean? Yeah. So so the differences, there are neurobiological differences between male and female brains. 
those differences occur in the brain structure, in the neural patterning, the way the brain focuses attention, and then in hormones uh, and different hormone levels. So three big areas of difference. And we're all a complex individual makeup of both nature, what we've been given by nature, and then nurture, what we've grown up with. So you will have a biological sex to your brain. The way that that then presents as as your individual brain is, I mean, our brains are as unique to us as our fingerprints. Um, So the, the sex of your brain could be different from the sex of your body in the way that you you you, you can uh, score it and that's something that is uh, people can do in in the first chapter of the book which is quite fun and interesting so it's a blend of nature and nurture that that will demonstrate the ultimate sex of your brain how does one go about figuring it out like what are the characteristics that would let you know what your brain sex is and how is it possible to have a different one than your (laughs) biological sex? Yes, absolutely. Well, your biological sex determines the, you know, your brain structure, your your neural connectivity and and your hormone levels up to a, up to a point. And then the way that nature, sorry, nurture and your experiences growing up blend with that will um, determine what your your brain ultimate brain sex is so for example I've got two um, wonderful sons yeah, young men now one of them on has a very male brain which um, he, he's a two out of 20 the other one has a, a more female brain so he's a 12 out of 20 which is the same brain sex score as as me and one of the differences, for example, and this is based on some very interesting research that came out of the University of Pennsylvania, is the neural patterning. So a male brain, the dominant patterning in the brain runs from front to back inside each hemisphere. This tends to mean that that, that the male brain will move from input in to, to quite focused, coordinated action out. The female brain, on the other hand, the predominant patterning is running between both hemispheres. And this tends to mean that that typically women's way of paying attention and and approaching um, problems and issues can be more emergent and iterative. And so a very different way of of going on. So my son, who has a very, very male brain score, he is... um, you know, phenomenal at, at, at coding and programming and focusing for, for long times on on very detailed, specific activities. Um, my other son, he, he's sort of notable for his 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 very high emotional intelligence and, and being able to read people very quickly. So, you know, they've had very very similar upbringings, and and yet their brain sex schools are quite different. When we call it a male brain or a female brain, how is that determined? Right. Because I'd imagine you could have called it a, I don't know, logical brain versus emotional Mm. brain. I make I'm saying things that are going to get me in trouble, I'm sure. But, (laughs) you know, was it like taking a bunch of men and looking at their brain and calling this the average male brain or. Right. Yeah. How does that work? No, what what we've got going on is a, a brain sex questionnaire, which was developed by a wonderful geneticist from Oxford University. And it, it's absolutely based in the underpinning neuroscience. And I'll just, I'll just give you some of the questions just as a bit of a for instance. Um, so one of them is, it's easy for me to hear what people are saying in a crowded room. So um, what the science shows us is, is that women hear more range in, in, in vocal tone on average than, than, than do men. And... So in a crowded room, women are more likely to be able to micro in on on some of the conversations that they can hear around them. So these are the kinds of questions. So the questions themselves um, are are quite high level, but they're all based in some deep underpinning science. So let me just find another one, because that was one that would have picked out more of a female brain. I don't like fast speeds. They make me nervous. Men have much higher levels of testosterone in their brains and bodies than than females do, so their appetite and relationship with risk is 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 going to be different. And so, a more male brain would would tend to say, 
um, that they they do like fast speeds. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of question. And, and like I say, it's it's um, I was given permission by the lovely Dr. Anne Muir to to reproduce the questionnaire in the book. Um, but it's uh, it, it's based in in the underpinning science. Correct me where in this thought process I'm wrong. So basically, there was some neuroscientists that went out and they ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions and then say, okay, this question tends to be answered one way by men. Therefore, that makes it a like a characteristic of a male brain. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ab ab absolutely. And and, and you know it, it's known um, from laboratory science that. Uh, women and men's hearing shows up um, with with significant uh, statistical differences because of the the the, audit, the auditory um, reception is different for for men and women on average. That makes sense. So, and I guess the point of that statement, what you're talking about, is look, we're not just asking general questions. A lot of them, or maybe all of them, you could clarify those answers make sense based on what we know physiologically. Absolutely. About it. Yeah. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so the questionnaire and the physiology together form, look, this is the standard or the baseline for a male and then a female, and then you draw a gradient between the two, and then people can find out where they fall on that? Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us some of the things that define male versus female brain? You know, because what I'm wondering is... What are the stereotypes that are actually true from a neuroscience level, and what are the ones that are false? Yeah, it, this is this this is an interesting one, Chris, because the the neurobiology that underpins um, the sex of our brain is given to us by 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 nature. We and and then we each have our own individual experiences growing up. So we. That there's a there's a huge amount that's in common between male and female brains. So on the distribution curve, many people will have a, a mosaic made up of you know pink and blue, if I can use that as a stereo stereotypical way of expressing it. And I think it's something only there's only about about sort of eight percent of of, of um, brains that would would fall into a very male or very female categorization. So a lot of us are are a mix. Um, that said, there are behaviours that are, tend to show up more typically for, for, for females and more typically for males. So, for example, um, men's brains and bodies contain between five and 20 times uh, uh, more testosterone than, than the female. And the testosterone is produced by a different part of the body and the female is less potent. And so it is more likely that one would see um, more competitive behaviours at the more male end of, of the brain sex spectrum. Um, now, not all men are, 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 sort of, are, are alpha males by any stretch sure. of the imagination. But what my research has been looking at is how well are organisations leveraging the different brain sexes that they have in their organisation. And what I'm discovering is that many corporate cultures tend to favour in, the, in their ways of working, in the way they, they, they reward things, what they, what notice, what they notice, what, what gets done, it tends to suit a sort of a, a, a more narrow band of, of brains at the more male end of the spectrum, therefore missing out on fully leveraging the more female brains in the organization, in women and in, in some of the men working there. And that's what I'm trying to help companies look at is where have they got like untapped latent brain potential that they could really not just, you know, it's already invited to the party, but it's not being allowed to dance right. because, of, because of the way things go on. And that actually makes so much sense to me from this perspective. I grew up playing sports in that culture and I didn't know this early on. I mean, I went into finance. I didn't like it. I now, without even taking a test, would know I, I definitely have to have more of a female brain because people are easy to me and people are, right. they're just almost everything. I mean, that's why eventually I found my way into the field I did, right. which is training, development, facilitation, coaching, where you have to be in tune to so much more of a person. And I'll never forget, I was talking to somebody after I'd started this career path and, and I said, well, it's just, it's not hard. Like it doesn't feel like mm. work really. Yeah. And, and it was the first time they said, yeah, it doesn't have to be hard like that. You know, you were just pushing up against the wrong 
rock or the wrong hill. And so I think to your point is when companies take somebody with whatever brain, say it's female, and then want them or their culture pushes them to be more male, it yeah. feels harder. They get less. They're probably more tired. All of those things, right? All of those things. Absolutely. Now the, because if you're forcing your brain to be something that it's not, and you know, I, I, I grew up in, in the corporate sector a long time ago now, but very often I'd be in a situation where I was literally trying to be the best man I could be mm -hmm. in, in order to survive in that environment. Now, you know, don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved it, but it was like driving with the handbrake on be because y y you're forcing yourself out, bending yourself out of shape to fit in and, and kind of perform in a culture that is not valuing the things that your own brain does naturally. That and that is, sense. to your point, really tiring. Yes, exactly. Now, why do you think the favoritism in the business world is towards a male brain? Yeah, I just, I, I think business has grown up over the years um, in, in a sense, based on the kind of militaristic model, you know, the hierarchical model. And if one looks historically at, at how businesses have grown over time, they have largely been populated by, by men. Um, and the stats, it, you know, it's still the case. If you look at how many, you know, female CEOs there are in the, in the, in the Fortune 500 uh, and the FTSE 250 in the UK. So it's still a very male dominated environment. And therefore, the thinking that has gone into how we're going to do things around here has been more based in, in, in a male way of thinking. Do you think it has to do anything with, you know, at the end of the day, most businesses, especially if you're in this kind of capitalistic ideal. Now, there's new things like B Corps and nonprofits obviously have existed. But in a standard for-profit business, the goal is obviously to make money and for your shareholders and all that. Making money can seem competitive. It can seem goal-oriented. It can seem it's a finite resource to be hoarded. And that leads to a competitive testosterone-driven approach. Is it possible that the goal of business is actually geared more towards that testosterone-driven male approach? And that's why? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, all the evidence is that when, when you've got more women on leading organizations, so balance, balance and, you know, women on the board, businesses outperform those businesses that are just run by men. Um, so companies with the most women board directors out, outperform on return on sales by, by around 16%. Companies with with a lot of women, the most women board directors outperform those with the least in terms of return on capital employed by twenty six percent. So women are equally good at making money and delivering profits for their for their businesses. They do it differently. They go about it in a different way, um, and and I would argue a, a more sustainable way. Mm. I'm glad you said that. Now, I mean, just to be clear, like. That was, I was hoping that was the case just for myself to be perfectly selfish. I mean, I've never, I just know I haven't been able to approach it that way. So I want to really get into that and understand how do we leverage that? How do we bring that on? Before we do, I want to stick to some of the, again, logistics or details of it. There was one thing you were mentioning, neural patterning. Mm. Um, could you tell us what that means? Yes. So this, this is looking at the connectivity in the brain. So how the signals are moving across the connectome, which forms the you know trillions of synapses in the human brain. Um, and the, the, the patterning, which, which actually then generates the way attention gets paid and, and the way thought processes occur in relation to the task is distinctly different between um, men and women. And, mm. you know, that's a, a really interesting thing to, to, to be able to see now. So, so the leading edge, cutting edge neuroscience that, uh, sorry, uh, scanning that is um, coming out is incredibly exciting. And we're, we're just going to find out more and more and more. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. 
As a member, every month you get one credit to pick any title, two Audible Originals, access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and guided meditation programs. To get started with a free trial, head to audible.com slash smart or text smart to 500-500. But listen, we're really all facing this new normal now. And as communities around the world confront new challenges, whether it's social distancing, school closures, being home from work, everyone has an immediate need to try to relax and stay entertained. This is where Audible can help. They've created Audible Stories. And these stories entertain, teach, and help keep our minds active, alert, and engaged. So if you've got kids that are away from school, or if you're just looking to relax, head over to stories.audible.com. There's a mix of titles that are suitable for the entire family to listen to, and each title is handpicked to provide a balanced mix of education, entertainment, classics, and general interest content. And on top of it, the stories are available in multiple languages from English, German, French, Spanish, Japanese, and Italian. The entire stories.audible.com is completely ad-free and anonymous, so there's no need to download an app, sign in, or log in. Just click, stream, and listen. And if you're like me, maybe you've had trouble sleeping over the last few months. Well, that's where Audible Sleep comes in. This is another resource that you don't need to be a member to access these free listens, but they're only available for a limited time during the quarantine. You can head to audible.com sleep to check them out. So if you're looking to relax and learn and just become more educated, go ahead and sign up for a free Audible trial. Again, you can go to audible.com smart or text SMART to 500-500. And now back to the episode. Yeah, and it's it sounds fascinating. Honestly, I know this is simplification, but I imagine male, it's just like comes in, you solve it, it goes out. And then the female portion is like thinking more deeply, making more connections, thinking holistically. I yes. don't know, that's how my mind views it. Yeah, the, yes, basically. That's the short answer. And Paul, um, he, he would say that, and I think... But, you know, better coming from him as a man. But he would say men, um, men fix problems. Women generate solutions is his <laughs> kind of shorthand way of putting it. OK, so you you dove me into the deep end here because as I'm learning this, I'm saying, so is there truth to this long known phenomenon where let's say a couple? OK, I happen to be married. So a husband and wife are having a conversation. Is there a truth to the stereotype that the man hears any complaining, any problems, any difficulties and says, I can solve that. I can solve that. I can solve yes. that. And the woman is thinking, I want to be heard. I want to feel connected. Is that actually true from a brain level? That is actually true. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is actually true from a, from a, a brain perspective. Yeah. And it's, wow. uh, it's just so helpful to know because <laughs> once you start to understand the underpinning neuroscience, it just explains a lot of stuff, makes it easier to understand the differences. So, so with my hus husband, we have some incredible conversations about the differences, particularly when we, 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 we find that we're misunderstanding each other or getting into some conflict. And it's, um, it's great to be able to really dissect it and start to get a real line of sight on what is it like to be in that other person's head. People might be listening going, yeah, Chris, I don't need neuroscience to tell me that. But I think my point is, you know, how much of this is my bias or just global stereotypes or relationship structures and how much is actually rooted in who we are? Because I think that's a, a dangerous thing to assume just because I notice it must make it true or biologically true. So I think it's nice to have that backing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and my, you know, my objective writing the book, because I, I said about writing the book after the financial crisis in back in 2008, or it's under, under, undertaking the research, because I, I had so many clients, and one in particular who lovely guy who was being paid a lot of money to do something important in a bank in London. And um, he was so stressed by the environment that he found himself in that he, he could not think well. And I, I came out of one session thinking, crikey, the return on investment on that man's brain is mm. terrible. And I can't imagine for one moment that the leadership of the organization would want to see such a poor return on investment or make him that miserable. Um, and I got 
fascinated by what does it take to create conditions for optimal brain performance? And as I really started digging and looking into the neuroscience behind that, it was very obvious very quickly, you just cannot ignore gender. You know, there are enough important differences between male and female brains that if you're serious about optimal conditions, you have to understand those underpinning gender differences. And then from there, really be able to drop down into what do those individual differences look like across your team and your organization. Now, when you're referring to gender there, are you referring to biological or brain? Both. Ah, so you're, Both. you're advocating for like, we have to realize there are kind of standard differences in the way the sexes operate. But then within the sexes, there's also plenty of differences in which we need to be aware of as well. Absolutely. Bingo. Nicely okay. said. <laughs> no, and I, I like your, t I like the way you go with it because of course the book could just be, Hey, everybody, here's some really fascinating information, but instead it's, here's how we use it to, and then again, get better results. And that could be in business, but it could be in relationships. It could be in friendships, et cetera. It doesn't absolutely. really matter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last step before we get into, cause of course I want to spend some time. How do we use this? Do we know what some of the impacts are, what some of those nurture items are that can shift a male to a female or a female to a male? Yes. So the early relationships that we have, so our attachment patterns are really important. So but when we're born, you know, our parents, our primary caregivers are our first bosses. And our, our siblings are our, our first peer group. And in those early attachment relationships, we, we, we learn to trust if we're lucky or maybe not if we're less lucky. And all of those experiences have their impact on our genetic expression. And um, so if I take myself as, a, as an example, I, I'm actually by nature, I'm quite a high um, testosterone female. Um, I'm also, I come from a family of, of, of three sisters, three girls. I'm the oldest child and um, I, I think my, my dad would have loved a son. So I'm the son my, my dad never had. And I'm uh, the, working, the working woman that my mom would have loved to have been but couldn't be because back in the day her dad thought women didn't deserve an education. So all of those expectations um, and birth order – have been part of my experience growing up. So for for a female, you know, I'm quite competitive, um, quite uh, assertive. Put it that way. Uh, some some people <laughs> might say a little more than that. But but you know, all all of that stuff has has, has got expressed in in my in my attachment patterning, mm. um, and that's helped me to be successful in business. You know back in the day when I was um, in the corporate scene. So yeah. it all plays a part. Yeah, that, that's actually fascinating. As I mentioned, I have two kids, two and five, and I know the fact that so much of the brain is developing early in life, right? So I'm imagining, let's say I have um, my oldest and he falls down and scrapes his knee and I say, suck it up, right? And then my youngest falls down and scrapes his knee and I say, hey, come here, buddy. It's okay. I'm sorry that happened to you. I mean, I know that's simplistic, but if you do that over many years, yeah. you're essentially telling them this behavior is okay and the brain will therefore probably adapt and rewire and then you lead towards one way versus the other. Fair? Absolutely. Yes. Fair. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That is putting way more pressure on me as a parent than I want. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because, well, and this gets us to kind of the main point is which one's better, you know? And I know the answer before you say it. I know you would never say one's better, but um, I'm sure it's a mix. But is there, let's start here. Is there a mix that we can target? Are you saying that a 10 would be perfect because you can tap into women and men? Or is there anything there to strive for maybe as a parent? Yeah, uh, let me answer that question in a different way because it's a, it's a really Im important question. So the brain, and this is really, really oversimplifying um, the, the science, but it's a really nice, easy, clear way to understand it. Our brains have two dominant modes, if you like. The first mode is survive. And that is when we feel somehow we're, in, we're, we're under threat 
and the emotional brain, which is a very ancient part of the of the brain, will put you into defense mode so that you're protecting yourself. And when we're in a survive mode, it's like driving with the handbrake on. It's tiring. We, we, we can't go as fast and be as effective as we would like to be. And because of the way the brain evolved, we know when, when, when we're not safe and we're in survive. The second mode is thrive. And that is when the emotional um, brain says, it's okay, you're safe, I, I can stand down. And it allows the prefrontal cortex to really, you know, get, go to town and, and do its job and think well. And then, and, and when we're in Thrive, we have endless amounts of energy and we can keep going at the task for a whole lot longer. And because we are mammals, we know when we're in under threat and we know when we're not and so those survive and thrive responses happen in the blink of an eye and they create a completely different neurochemistry in our in our brains and bodies to go with them and as a parent seeking to figure out what makes your puts your children's brains into thrive is is what it's all about so if i take myself as an example of my two boys who are very different people um I will generate a conversation with my son who, who, who's got the very high male brain sex score by asking him something really technical about his work that, that absolutely lights him up. He, you know, he's a seriously bright guy and he's just um, coming out of an aeronautics uh, master's program. Anyway, oh. I don't understand most of what he talks about, um, but he can explain it to me in a way that I can get the concepts. But that puts his brain into thrive. My other son... If I want to tap into his world, I'll ask him about some some recent kind of social connection he's had with some of his mates. That lights him up, and then and then we're in, then we're in thrive together. And so it's it's looking for what are the triggers that are going to create thrive for the brain that I have before me, and that's why understanding about these brain sex differences is really important because it gives you far more information about how to generate a thrive environment for that brain mm, does that all make sense chris it does it does actually because in the same way i mean i i always relate things to my own experiences because that's really all we have but for example say i'm uh, giving a presentation or even writing an email if i get feedback that is in my opinion not necessarily making me better but making me more what i now would call male not only does it not feel helpful it feels punitive, right? Yes. It's like, hey, like I one time I think I had somebody say, hey, you shouldn't use more than, I don't know, one exclamation mark in an email or something, right? Well, to me, that's really stressful because when I'm with people, I like them to know they're included and we can yes. go fast and all this. So if it's a written dialogue, I want you to know the same. And I have yes. far less tools in my toolbox. So when you remove those tools, you're stifling who it is to be me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. It, it does make sense. Even now, move that to this face-to-face, -face, what allows people to bring out who they are and what they have to offer. Mm. And now if we shift into the business world, is going to get you those better results. Yeah, absolutely. So like how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is this was part of the reason we we wrote the book is i you know i, I work in applied neuroscience in organizations so it's i, I all i care about is the how to <laughs> yeah, how, how do organizations create brain friendly environments that get the best of all the brains so you have to work in the way that the brain works which is bottom up so the brain evolved in three stages the first part was the reptilian brain that we inherited from our reptile ancestors 360 million years ago then the emotional brain that I was talking about just now, that's about 65 million years old. That's what came into being when the first mammals came on stream and gave birth to live young. So, And it's the seat of emotion. It has no cognitive capacity, rational capacity, but just emotion. And then much, much later, so 220,000 years ago, the prefrontal cortex, which is the really smart part of the human brain. So the brain works bottom up. Um, with the emotional brain coming on stream three times faster than the rational brain. So um, one of the means, the models of communication that I've 
been trying and, and, and testing with, with, with clients, um, you know, busy people, working hard, limited resources, is, is what I, I call it the rich communication model because that's easy to understand. So starting with recognition, what is there to recognize and appreciate about the person's contribution? So if we take your example, Chris, it might be something like, golly, I love your enthusiasm, Chris. It, it's great that and I can really hear it speaking through the emails. That's fantastic. Mm. I is for intention. Where's this conversation going? I'd like to talk to you about style, some stylistic, stylistic questions, issues. C is for challenge. What's the, what's the challenge? What's the issue? Plus a solution. You know, one of the things I've noticed is you use an awful lot of exclamation marks. And I wonder if that sometimes waters down the impact of your message. So can we have a think about that? And then H, the H is for hope. Um, and that is to switch on the dopamine systems in the brain. Um, sorry, the, the challenge piece. Once the prefrontal cortex gets hold of a problem or a challenge, it loves it. it, it it'll start to get um, into solution mode. Um, and then hope engages the dopamine systems in the brain. So you, so the the R and the I, the recognition and the intention, that will settle down the limbic system, the emotional brain, by soothing it and, and showing, demonstrating to the person that you, you see, you understand, you value them. Once you've done that, then you can move into the cortex and start engaging in the problem. And then hope will, will switch on the dopamine system, the reward centers in the brain. And, and you paint the picture of what this could look like when it's really working well. It's like, I'd really like to help you, Chris, because I don't want to, you know, I'd like I'd, you're such a super communicator. I, I, I'd like to support you to be effective in a whole variety of, uh, of environments. So that makes sense, especially given I know a, a little bit about the brain. And I, as soon as you said the R part, I realized that what that's allowing people to do is really say, okay, this is not an attack on me. This yeah. is somebody who cares about me. You know, same thing with, was the I intent? Intention, yeah. So Intention. what you're doing is you're flagging where the conversation's going because the limbic system is always on the lookout for being attacked. Yeah. And, and so yeah, it's kind of that. waiting to be doorstopped, if you like. And so just by flagging where the conversation's heading, you're signposting to the brain the direction of travel, which means that the limbic system is less likely to feel um, hijacked, you know, just to sort of all of a sudden taken by surprise. Let's take a quick break for this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. I got my first cell phone with one of the big wireless providers mm, 20, 25 years ago, and I've honestly hated my monthly bill ever since. But then I discovered there's another option that could give me the premium service I'm used to at a fraction of the cost. I could cut my wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month and save hundreds of dollars by switching to Mint Mobile. For anyone out there who's looking to save without sacrificing service, switching to Mint Mobile is a no-brainer. For customers that hate their wireless bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile can pass significant savings on to you. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text plus crazy fast 4G LTE. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven day money back guarantee. Switch to Mint Mobile today and get premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash smart. That's mintmobile.com slash smart. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. I will tell you that was actually a skill I learned about five years where um, I was learning to teach a class about project management, which you would be like, how? But in project management, you have to have a lot of these conversations where you're saying, hey, you, you basically screwed this up or we're off track or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you start almost any of these difficult conversations with the intent, you take the pressure off of them as an individual and yeah. you put it more towards the outcome you're seeking. So it's, hey, you know, 
uh, my intent here is just to get this project back on track. And when, as soon as you say that, you know, you watch people almost, oh, okay, Absolutely. it's not me screwing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is, that is a really clear signal to that person's amygdala in the limbic system, in the emotional brain to say, I come in peace, yeah. I want to help. And that is such a soothe to the nervous system. And what happens is the emotional brain basically runs the show. So it can control where the blood flow, where the energy flow goes. And so if it thinks that you are under enough threat and in enough danger, it will dominate, uh, it will sort of su suck up the energy that is available to the brain. And mm. that energy, the blood flow won't go to the cortex. And so you literally can't think well while, 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 when you're anxious about something. I'm curious, how does this differ from other assessment type tools? Being in this space, I'm well aware of a number of kind of different things where, hey, as a leader, you need to know your people so you can uh, lead to their style. Now, I do think that's a fairly new concept, but it is gaining a lot of traction as people realize if I want to get more from somebody, I have to lead in the way they need to be led. So how does this differ from maybe like a strengths-based approach where you just put people through a profile and say, okay, they like this, I need to do that. They like this, I need to do that. Or is it just another tool? I, I think the big difference here, Chris, and I think this is really important. So psychological theory and many of the associated tools that go with it for the last 100 years has been based on descriptive, the description of the behaviors. So we've been looking in from the outside and thinking, oh gosh, if I see this person doing this, so it, must, it might mean that in terms of what's motivating them. The exciting thing about the neuroscience is we're shifting from a descriptive model to an explanatory model. Very early days, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a young um, scientific sector, but we're starting to be able to understand what, what is actually going on in, in the brain and the body um, and, and the motivational system. And so um, something like a strengths finder, that, that, that I think would, is an interesting approach because you're, you're tapping into the things that, that put that person's brain into thrive neurochemically. So um, that's that that's a good thing, um, and and the neuroscience can help go deeper. I think into understanding what it is that 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 um, creates a thrive neurochemistry in any given individual. Now, you, I know through your profession, you go around, you consult with a number of large businesses and powerful people, etc. I'm curious. Well, one, if you've ever heard this, I'm, and I imagine you have to, and then how you respond when somebody says, look, this is all well and good, but I can't possibly do this for all of my people. I mean, it's exhausting. Say I lead 20 people. I have to know, okay, you're a two, you're a four, you're a seven. So I got to address you this way, you this way, you this way, you know, instead, can't they either adapt to me or can't we just kind of all be nice, but, but work with some general themes here? Right. Well, I, I would say that if that's how you feel about your people, then you shouldn't be leading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it very simply. And um, uh, I think it's the leader's job is to create the emotional response in the people around them on purpose by design uh, with mm. a view to uh, activating th the neurochemistry of Thrive. And honestly if you if you can't be bothered to do that then you're not you're not a leader yeah. um, in 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 my book uh, that said of course you know leaders are, are, are busy um many leaders are leading you know casts of thousands so how do you create that emotional resonance across the whole system you do it. I mean, our, our brain is the organ of relationship. We are designed by nature. We've evolved to be in relationship. We, we've evolved to attach, not to detach. And leaders who are genuinely committed to creating the neurochemistry that enables people to, to be and thrive as much of their day as they possibly can be, they will reap the rewards at, you know, and some in terms of creating sustainable businesses. Yeah. Um, and 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 the models that that um, I've developed and been testing with clients, they are designed to be used. 
they're frameworks that work in a brain friendly way. They're simple, they're clear, they can be used in a whole variety of situations from individual conversations to big set pieces you know, in, a, in a virtual environment um, to support the conditions for optimal brain function. Yeah, well, you actually led me right into something I just thought of, which is, is there anything we can do as leaders that's larger, meaning that's more uh, systemic, you know, to create mm -hmm. an environment. So instead of I have to do this conversation by conversation, yeah. I can create it in which you can all thrive, maybe even without me. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, and this is what I, I'm working on with clients is how do you create work cultures that actually support the brain to be and thrive? And, um, it, and, and Google did some very interesting um, research a few years ago now into what is it that really creates like super engagement and what they found. And again, the, the, the neuroscientific evidence is, is huge on, on this question, is that when teams trust their leader, they are you know, almost 80 percent more engaged than teams where the, the trust is kind of you know not quite there or not there at all. And and so it's it all comes down to the quality of of relationships that exist across the whole organisation, and um, one of my, you know my definition of, of an effective co corporate culture is is the thing that defines a culture is the worst behaviour that is tolerated within that culture. Uh -huh. So if you've got a leadership that is genuinely committed to creating you know thrive in the workplace um the first thing to do is that commitment the second thing to do is educate people about the the underpinning neuroscience and and provide the simple tools that people can use to create brain friendly interactions um and then really look carefully at what what are you measuring what are you rewarding what are you focusing on because you get what you focus on right. And um, you know some some of the teams that I've I've worked with where they focus on contribution to the team effort as opposed to you know uh, individual winning. Mm -hmm. Those are the teams where where thrive is the, the you know the the common um, the dominant state of mind um, in, in the organisation. So yeah, you can you, you can genuinely do it. You can do it at scale um, if if you if that's what you choose. I love that. Yeah, it's almost you, you were saying kind of if you remove a little bit of that competitiveness and replace it with a little bit of communal emotions, then by nature we're going to have a slightly less of that amygdala firing because we're not trying to you know take the last food on the savanna. We we kind of believe we can all get it together. Exactly. Yeah. And there's some yeah. wonderful research that came out of MIT and, and Carnegie Mellon, um, which showed that teams that are gender balanced, so 50-50 or even 60-40 female male, th those teams where you're genuinely getting the best of both, the IQ, the collective IQ of the team is higher than the sum of the IQs of the individuals. So, so a, a gender balance in a team will help the team get smarter. That doesn't surprise me, actually. Um, Kate, I know we're coming up on time. Do you have about five more minutes or do you have a hard stop? Yeah, no, you bet. I'm good. Okay. okay. Because I want to make sure we get in. Um, we have three questions that were submitted by our Patreon supporters. And just a reminder to those listening, if you're a Patreon supporter, for the most part, you're going to get to ask our guests a question and you get a chance to ask people like Kate. So. Uh, if you're a leader, I mean, Kate charges a lot, I'm sure. I don't know, <laughs> but I know you do. And you get a free little consulting session. So I just have three questions here for you. The first is, what does the research say about women and men with regard to their ability to empathize? Right. So um, the research shows that uh, on average, w w women are more programmed better programmed by nature to empathize and there's so uh, the, a number of um, aspects to this one is the oxytocin which is the bonding hormone the oxytocin levels are higher by between five and 20 times in 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 the female brain and body than in men um, secondly the um the the, the gut 
um, brain interaction is, um, and I, I, I don't have time to go into the, sure. into the detailed science, but all the references are in the book. So this is very specifically talked about in the book, um, are stronger in, in women. And um, there is some evidence that the mirror neurons, which are the, the our capacity to sort of feel what other people are, are feeling, is greater in, in, in women. Oh, my gosh. You just touched on three things that, like, I know a little bit about and I absolutely love. So uh, I'm going to have to look at that section a little bit more deeply. All right. Another one. What is your opinion on the gender gap in tech? So in the tech industry, and just from reading that question, I'm, I'm, I think a little bit about your son that you mentioned. So yes. um, take that where you may. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, yeah, this is something I, I you know, think a lot about and, and, um, and talk a lot about with all sorts of colleagues and friends and clients. So I think that, um, Typically, the the way the tech sector has has grown up has suited more male brains better. Uh, the all, all the evidence is that female brains are just as good, just as competent, come at things in a different way. And I, you know, one of my my um, clients is a very very top level scientist at a leading world renowned university. And he teaches stuff that would be considered sort of fairly hardcore, typically male. Yet he runs one of the m most diverse groups in his particular university. And he talks a lot about how the way the female brain approaches some of the challenges and issues is just different. And and he is very, very competent and has won awards for his diversity and inclusion work. But he, he's very good at, at explaining things and setting out um, the learning in a way that suits different brains and actually what's happened over the years is he he's now I think he's attracting more women into his research groups than than men that certainly wasn't the case a few years ago so I th and this is why I think understanding the, the brain sex differences is, is just is so important awesome thank you for that all right last one I think this is actually a great one to end on what is one action that the average person can take given the knowledge that we've gained today, right? Given this um, understanding of how the brain operates. So what's yes. one action that the average person can take and apply it in their workplace, specifically when interacting with coworkers who might not share the same level of responsibility or motivation? Right. Okay, great. Love it. I mean, it's great that people are asking these sorts of questions. Yeah, it's so um, cool. It's so cool. So I, I would say... Um, Use use the rich model, recognition, intention, challenge plus solution, hope and vision for the future outcome. So really look at the, the, the person you see before you and try and figure out what their triggers are to put them into Thrive and start to flex your communication style by beginning to understand the different differences in the, in the brains of the people that you're you're working with and with the rich approach you can't go far wrong um, and it will help you develop your your capacity to flex your style regardless of the seniority of the people that you're working with perfect and that is one we can all use i was just thinking of it too you know you can if you're working with somebody who's more technically savvy you can kind of point out the uh, detail of their work you know somebody who's more yeah higher EQ. You can talk about how the, they connected. I mean, really, you could see how that works and not in a superficial way, in a, I, I notice your differences. I value them. Here's some feedback and here's what I think it could do for you almost. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. This has been brilliant. I literally could talk to you for days, but that's the beauty of having on authors because you can read more of their incredible work. So your book is all the Brains in the Business, the Engendered Brain in the 21st Century Organization. Uh, before we let you go, I want to ask, you know, what else are you up to? Where can we find you? Are there places we can read even more up or learn more about this topic that uh, you are putting out there? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Because I'm, you know, the reason I wrote the book, Chris, was not because I wanted to become an author and sell books, but I just, I want to really get into a big conversation with, with people who care about changing the world for the, for the better. And, you know, boy, do we need to do that more than ever oh, at yeah. this kind of odd pivot point 
at, in history, but it's also a huge opportunity. So um, I'm really keen to link in and talk to people. Um, my link, my I'm on LinkedIn. It's Kate Lanz, L-A-N-Z. My um, website is Mindbridge. W, so it's www.mindbridge.co.uk. And I'm really happy to answer any questions people have got and um, just, you know, engage in as big a conversation about really creating environments where all the brains can thrive um, based on an understanding of the neuroscience. The, the world will be a better place and we need to do this in collaboration and understanding of each other because the kinds of issues that we're, we're fronting into now as this pandemic has shown us, we can only solve by through collaboration and cooperation and so we need business and leadership to really engage in a, a thoughtful intelligent way yeah it's like you use kind of a trojan horse to have a much bigger conversation right it's like sure you can be a better leader but we can change the world if we all understand the strength of our differences both through biology and through you know our experiences absolutely yeah absolutely well, Kate, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise, Chris. Now, thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure. See, I kept my promise. I told you we'd be back with better sounding audio. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kate Lands. Kate's book, All the Brains in the Business, The Engendered Brain in the 21st Century Organization, can be found wherever books are sold. All right, let's get all the housekeeping out of the way. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And if you want to support the show, the easiest way is to leave us a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you listen to your podcasts with. And if you ever want to support us monetarily, you can head over to Patreon at patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. And if you want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. I hope you all are doing well, staying sane, learning, relaxing, just doing whatever you have to do during this crazy, crazy time. But make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode. <laughs>